you know? And so I keep looking back. You know, I'm 60 years old, I look back, Jesus Christ, those were the days. I don't know how those were the days, because I was a pinhead man. And I've learned so many new things now that I keep looking forward. And people begin to worry about their aging process, but they don't understand that you're picking up new bits and you can handle the situation. Would you rather be 17 again? How would you like the value system uh, when you were 17? Say, you know what I mean, it's not worth a shit. No, but it must be something quite interesting as people keep looking back to their youth, how much they've really missed or how little they've learned in time. What they've been doing is uh, going around a barrel, you know what I mean, a motorcycle, continuously. And then they lost the ability to do that. They went downhill, their income was less, and they were invited to less social affairs and back here. They keep thinking about the motorcycle and the barrel. Those are the big days. So they get older and older and older, and they can hardly ride a motorcycle now, and they're still over there. And they go back, and I was telling some of the people here about my family. Uh, they lived through the Depression, and they, they actually never did travel much, and then once they went to Atlantic City for three weeks. Boy, for 20 years thereafter, did we ever tell you about the time we went to Atlantic City? Yeah, there's nothing there with ocean and boardwalk, and I didn't do anything unusual. But they remember that, and a lot of people that live in scarcity remember that in the early days. But you meet kids today, you know, 17, they've been to Paris and England, they've been to France, you know. They say, you know, I, I was in California, so The world is shrinking and people move around, they drive across country, they go to Yellowstone National Park many times, and it doesn't mean anything. And how do you talk to people that have walked on to that, that have lived through the last depression? Are you, uh, will you be discriminating against them? You just say, I don't place much value in that kind of conversation. I'm sure you, they say, you say, do you like honest people? They say, it's the only way to be. That I don't place any value in your conversation. Not that honest. People don't want honesty. What the hell is honesty? Honesty would be the most offensive kind of behavior you can think of. If Diogenes found an honest man, you're going to tell him you're never going to find anything resembling an honest man. To be honest, you have to know everything about everything to be that certain. You know, if someone asks you to tell them the truth, you say, I'm not that wise. They can only tell you a little bit of what I know about a given subject. Some of you may not understand that. No one can tell the truth. The truth would mean uh, that the judge in convicting somebody was a victim of circumstances, and he was very angry at the, at the person that committed that crime because his values had no bridge to understand the physical forces that caused that person to commit that crime. Or as Clarence Darrow said, that the man that commits the crime is the same as any other man, except the circumstances they were raised under were different, and it led them to that conclusion. He didn't get mad at people. And so, how do you, how do you deal with the one of those things? And do you want to? And sometimes it's better, John, for you to collect a hell of a lot of books, build a lot of things, and learn a lot of things as much as you can, and then go to areas where you can share some of those things on physical anthropology. You meet with these people that are physical anthropologists and you share what you can with them. And you talk to electronics people about electronic subjects and engineers about engineering subjects. But I find if you deviate too much from the subject, you lose contact. If you surpass your friends in electronics, then you can't visit them anymore. You find this, that the people you were very close to 10 years ago I don't know what happened to him. He became a loner. What, what happens is that people are not that interesting to you anymore. You don't place a value in the subjects they cherish. You know, uh, I, don't, I don't know what to say when somebody says, you know, come over to the house, it's my, my baby's birthday. You know, well, put the baby in the other room and we'll sit there and bullshit. Right? Uh, I, I used to say to my brother, come on over, we'll leave the kids home. You know, but. Uh, he knew what I meant, but he, he didn't like it. He didn't like it. Do you understand what I mean? Dad, go around the kid's uncle. You know, whatever that meant. I never knew what an uncle was. How do you get to be an uncle? What's an uncle? Is an uncle the thing that can give you a blood transfusion if you need it? Is an uncle any physically referential thing that can serve? Just a victim of certain values. This is my nephew. Well, maybe that person was switched in the hospital. Maybe you took the wrong kid home. <laughs> not your nephew. I don't even know if my kids are my kids. I really honestly don't really know that. They may be, they may not be. But it doesn't matter. You treat all kids pretty nice, you don't have to worry about that. I don't want fresco and stamped on the thumb. 
Besides, my daughter doesn't have fresco. She gets married, I'm losing me. Lose so well, having too many daughters doesn't serve the idea of fresco getting going on in the future. And I want that. What do you want it for? Now, Ford, of course, he's a smart guy. You buy a truck and you carry a label on the back. Ford. <laughs> You're a living billboard for the Ford Motor Company. I don't want his fucking name. When I pay for that truck, I want Fresco's three fingers or whatever the hell I've got to sell on the back of that truck. But there are people that drive trucks with the names of companies. They are intruding. I can send them a bill. Because they have posted their name on my truck without asking me. You won't get anywhere. But you, you, they, some people do that. They can't do it in architecture. I don't think they ever have a Louis B. Schmidt home. Or, uh, I don't think I've ever seen that. But I've seen buildings called Rockefeller Center. I've seen things like that. But if I buy the building, you tear down the name, people can't find it anymore. So they buy a corporation, and sometimes they buy the name. It might be your company, John's company. And everybody knows it, and they buy a lot of stuff in that company. And suddenly when they buy you out, they don't want to change the name. And if somebody later finds out that John's company became the most corrupt company in the world, they pull their friends away from you. They say, but I'm no longer friendly. It doesn't make any difference. Isn't that interesting? This is a sad thing about people. And if you found out, say, that I've been married for 20 years and my wife was a prostitute, the neighbors are not going to invite me over. I said, I didn't know that. And so uh, they have a certain set about those things. They are bad people. I don't, I don't even know how to wrestle with it. I don't even know where to begin. And is it worth beginning? All right, before I get on the subject I want to talk about with you tonight, I just want to say when I went back to New York, and all the relatives came over, my mother was about 80 years old, and I poisoned them. I hit them with thousands of different values, you know, and their kids were there, and my sister came out and said, don't you use that kind of language in my home. And my sister was an enemy, you know. So I said, well, I can leave now. And all the relatives said, no, nah, it's a good idea for the kids to hear that. And they voted her out. And she went back in the kitchen for her to cook. You know, her occupation. But she was invited in. She wasn't kept out of me. Now, no one turned and said, don't you have any respect for your sister? I don't even know what respect means. I say that the reason I talk to you, my relatives, like this, is because I respect you. That's hard to understand. I think, you know, fuck that shit to my relatives. And uh, I say, I respect you. I don't conceal that. I must trust your ability to handle this linguistic difference. So respect is the ability to say to somebody, I've got bleeding piles. I don't care about your pile. And why do you ask me how my throbbing eyelid was? No, aren't you concerned about my health? They always say, well, I got a headache. People, that's all you want. You say, give an aspirin. They say, I got an infected ear. It must be very painful. But very few people walk around and say, I got an infected asshole. You know, don't do that. I used to say, you know, years ago, I say to my wife, I got to take a shit. She says, don't tell me, just go and do it. <laughs> and so, uh, I, she said, I'm going out to hang the laundry on the laundry. She said, no, why do you tell me that? You know, I'm going down to get a quart of milk. You know, we want to share all things, you said. But not that. <laughs> so, you run into a lot of problems, and I just want to briefly uh, say this. It's the story of driving a car in a garage, and you say to the mechanic, what's wrong with it? He says, the differential housing. And you say, how can we talk about that part of the car? How can you talk about that part of the car? When well, you talk about everything and anything without, without inhibition, except to a judge in a court of law, because he doesn't want to know that. You can't confront a judge and say, how do you make that decision? He's got a book in front of him that tells him what decision to make. He's not interested in other concepts and ideas. You can't get up as a free American thinker and say, I don't hold with that point of view. I consider it obsolete. $1,000. Ah, that, now he's communicating. That's real semantics. <laughs> you buy the guy, you buy the judge, or you put him in. You put the congressman in there. You don't have to tell him every week what you want. He knows what you want because he gets a check. If it stops coming, he, he can't operate. Okay, we're going to talk about biochemical conditioning and, and learning without experience. And there's a possibility of that. And it has nothing to do with the worm experiments or the DNA. It has to do with something like this. In the, in the learning process of all organisms, there is an input device you pick it up from your nose, your eyes, your ears, your tongue, and they all come into the brain. 
and there are all kinds of cross associations. But if you could impart information into people, if you could do this, put two electrodes on the head of a person and play information into the brain, you will not have the cross association. You'll have a glass and you'll have milk, but, and you'll have milk in the glass, but how come it's put in a glass as a container? And why you select the glass will not be known. But if you pipe that in, you'll have a file on milk, glass, drinking milk and glass, and there'll be very little cross associations. If you pump in the cross associations, let me say it this way. I, I can say it in a way in which you'll understand it. Now, I thought about it, but it may be misunderstood. Here's how you understand. Let's assume that due to shock, Van lost his ability to walk. He just can't walk. He's frightened, so he saw some horrible condition, and he's unable to walk. So we stick two electrodes into the muscles, into the spinal area, and we play the walking cycle into his legs. You know what I mean? Now, they say, how do you walk? How is it that you're walking? I just believe me, I really don't know. And there he is walking. And a lot of people think because you can walk, you know how you walk. Even people that can walk don't know how they walk. They don't say there's a discharge of two millivolts that runs down through the spinal cord and differentiates into certain nerve centers and causes contraction of 4,200 fine, of the fine muscles on the left area. And the, they don't know that. They don't know how they walk. Have you tell a person, can you see? I've been blind for years. The person says, yeah, I can say, how do you see? With my eyes. That's a fucking answer. People think they're answering questions. How do you learn to walk with crutches? He says, like this. <laughs> and even in books on semantics, there's no information. So the question is, what is learning? Now, does a person who can't do any weaving, can can't weave a blanket, if I connect the fat electrode to the head and transmit to the brain and nervous system, and they start weaving, <laughs> they're amazed, as amazed as you are. And so we say, how do you do it? I don't know, I got some thing connected to my head. And, the hand, and then you say, stop doing that, scratch my back, and the hands won't do that, if you play that loop. And if you play a walking loop, and you decide not to walk, you go right on walking. I don't know whether you've ever had a high voltage thing put in your hand that closes on it. In the early days, an electrician would try to see if something's alive, he'd go like that. If it's alive, his hand will close on it, on a wire like that, and he'll die. And so what they do, they hit it like that, and the reflexes get yelling away. It depends on the voltage. But if, it's, if it goes the other way. And there's a guy, if a guy is working in an electrical system, he's down on his knees, and he makes contact. These muscles contract, and I've seen a guy crack his head on the ceiling. He'd never jump that high with 250 volts. Right up to the ceiling, clunk. He said, how'd you do that? He doesn't know how he did it. All right. They don't know the difference between conditioning, which moves the muscle, or a reflex, artificial reflex. All right. Let's take a a Frenchman that can't speak English. Let's assume we can do this. Uh, run electrodes to the brain or to the vocal mechanism directly. And how are you, Sam? I'm from Brooklyn. Call me a cup of coffee. You run the electrodes in. You have know what he's saying. Neither does a Frenchman. If you turn to a Frenchman and he said, give me a cup of coffee in French, you say, what do you mean by a cup of coffee? He said, you know, a cup of coffee. He doesn't know what that is either. That's why a computer. And he said, hey, you can work it out. The computer says, computer says, well, this is how I worked it out. It can't say how I worked it out. There's no circuit in the computer to tell you how it worked it out. All right, when you learn to ski, you don't learn how to learn about how you learn to ski. You just get on skis, and the guy says, you know, turn your toes in and lean when you're going downhill this way or that way. When you want to turn, jump, you know? Or when you want to water ski, you do this. They're giving you the gross reflexes necessary for that. But if they gave you a description of all the muscles involved in learning the ski, you said, you got to learn how to control all that, you got to learn how to flex this muscle. You learn how to twist my wrist. So I want to say something about the learning process. It is not so much that we really learn, but so we're stimulated to simulate parallel verbal behavior and verbal behavior that others require of us. Like you hold up a dog a little while and feed it, then put your hands under it and feed it, and pretty soon it gets up. And, and feed it. If you say to the dog, how do you do that? The dog then will say, well, come on to the other room and I'll lay it out. All right, that's the same thing with love, hand holding, the whole sort. We don't know what it is, because they never grabbed us when we were very young and conditioned us to a method of analyzing the kind of conditioning that's being superimposed upon us. And the more books you read that are, that are quite different from the cultural views that are established, something happens in your head. 
you get a different kind of set. And so you hear different views and you reject them right away. You don't get conditioned, but you now have a screening process. The stuff comes in and bounces off. I'm sure you've read a lot of books and said, you know, hogwash, and some of the areas were all right. You know what I mean by the built-in screening process? All right, so you can be conditioned by certain people if they have the elements to condition you. And you can't condition certain people. And if you succeed in getting a guy to read Loeb or a gal to read Loeb and other books and, and Tyrannial words and many of the books that you like, it doesn't mean that the rest of the mental set is going to be able to file it in the appropriate region. 